Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you happen to stop by the church during the morning over the next few weeks or months when I am in the office, don't be surprised if you find me there sitting in my office looking maybe a little bit tired or a little bit bleary-eyed or something like that. It's not that I've been working too hard, either with my work here at the church or with that schoolwork stuff that I got going on too, or it's not that I'm sick or got any other problem going on or anything else like that either. Instead, the tiredness or the bleary-eyedness, which you may see on my face if you happen to stop by the church in the morning when I'm here over the next weeks or maybe even months, is a result of the fact that the Edmonton Oilers, my favorite hockey team, are in the playoffs. And there's many things I love about living in Ontario, but the fact that Edmonton Oilers hockey games don't usually start in our time zone until after 10 p.m. is not one of them. I don't stay up and watch very many hockey games during the regular season, but the the playoffs are a little bit more compelling, and I sometimes am enticed to stay up and watch a period or two or three, and then they go to overtime, and it gets late and late and late and late, and it's morning by the time I'm really ready to go to bed. So if you see me looking tired sitting around in my office some mornings, don't be surprised. I've been a fan of the Edmonton Oilers about as long as I can remember since I was a small kid. But I was born after, you see, the Oilers traded away Wayne Gretzky. Some of you might remember when that happened, traded him to Los Angeles. So the Oilers haven't been particularly good throughout most of my lifetime. They won the Stanley Cup in 1990 when I was a year and a half old, and they made kind of a miraculous run to the Stanley Cup Finals back in 2006. But other than that, it's been pretty bleak for Oilers fans such as myself for a very long time. But the last couple of years, the last few years, have been kind of different. In 2015, the Edmonton Oilers got the opportunity to draft a guy named Connor McDavid, Kind of maybe have heard of him. And he's proven himself to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, hockey players in the world right now. And with a player like that on your hockey team, it feels like there's kind of always a reason to be hopeful. Dare I say, optimistic. It's been 34 years since the Oilers won much of anything at all, and there's 15 other teams right now that are all vying for the very same thing. But with a player, a truly great player on the team, it feels like there is a reason, a good reason, for fans like myself to be kind of hopeful. And in a similar kind of way, the Apostle John in our epistle reading today, he wants us to see that with Jesus around us and truly in us, we have an even better, a very, very, very good reason to be hopeful. He who is in you, John tells us today, is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John's warning us here, especially in the first part of our reading today, about some things that will threaten our faith in Jesus. He's warning us in particular about false prophets, false spirits, which threaten to lead us astray from the one true faith. Many false prophets, John says, have gone out into the world. So it it is necessary, he says, to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. John calls these false prophets, or better yet, the, the spirit that is behind these false prophets, he calls them the spirit of the Antichrist, and says that 
The spirit of the Antichrist is in the world already, and he's writing this 2,000 years ago. Now, this is important. The term Antichrist, whenever that happens to pop up in some Bible reading, that's something that immediately grabs people's attention. But a lot of us are kind of just left scratching our heads, wondering what that's all about when we hear something like that in the Bible or hear it read in church or something like that. But John spells it out for us here, what this is about. The spirit of the Antichrist, he says, the spirit that is anti or against Jesus, it's just the spirit of false teaching. It's just that simple. There's no beast rising out of the sea here or something like that. There are other Bible passages that talk about the Antichrist and fill in the blanks a little bit more, but we don't need to worry about that here this morning. What John wants us to see is that there are opponents, very real opponents, who have their mindset on leading us away from our faith in Jesus as the Son of God who's come in human flesh, who's come to us as God in human flesh in order to bear our sin and be our Savior. The spirit of the Antichrist, John says, is every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior of the world who has come to save us from our sin. Now, I'm pretty sure that what John says here about false prophets, false teachers, the fact that they exist and that there are some around us in the world today, the fact that John says that, I'm sure that doesn't really surprise you. You know this. We know this. We've all encountered some kind of false uh, teachers, false preacher of Christianity or something like that. You turn on the TV, you flip to those religious channels, and you'll just kind of see a lineup of them, one after another after another. They're often good speakers who make all kinds of persuasive arguments, which sound like they're kind of based on the Bible, but in the end they say very little, if anything at all, about Jesus and even less about him coming in the flesh to suffer and die for the sins of the world. And then they ask you to send money to them to support their ministry or something like that. But there are more false teachers out there in the world than just the ones that happen to appear on the religious TV channels. Social media has become a prominent place where you can find these kinds of things. We broadcast our church services out on YouTube and Facebook, and a lot of other faithful churches do the same, and that's a wonderful thing. But for every faithful church that's broadcasting God's word out into the Internet, there's hundreds, if not millions, of others, because just about anybody can open a YouTube account or a Facebook account and start sending things out there. And there's hundreds, if not millions, of people who are doing the exact opposite. And the algorithms on YouTube and Facebook, they don't have theology degrees. They don't understand what constitutes good teaching, so you never know what's going to pop up next if that autoplay feature that YouTube and things like that have. Not only that, but out there in the internet and out there in the world, there's all kinds of people posting and saying all kinds of different things. They may not claim to be Christian or even religious, and we might think that these things are maybe safe or harmless because they're not claiming to be Christian or even religious. We like to say that they're secular things and religious things. But that's kind of a false dichotomy. That doesn't really exist. Even secular things, even non-religious things can be false teachers, false prophets who are threatening to lead us astray. And then, of course, there's just the entire pressure of the culture, the society that's all around you, the very unchristian culture and unchristian society which is all around you, which is a kind of false teacher, false prophet all on its own, de-emphasizing Jesus, kind of just cornering him away to a little place on Sunday mornings or something like that, and de-emphasizing his coming in the flesh to be your savior, to take away your sin, and teaching you instead to put your trust in yourself or in something else like that. Truth be told, and this is what John wants us to see, we're surrounded by false teachers, false prophets who are operating under that spirit of the Antichrist all the time. 
And this is why John wants us, right at the beginning of our reading today, to test the spirits. He wants you to think critically and evaluate pretty much everything that you see and hear, even this sermon that I am preaching to you right now. He wants you to listen to what you're hearing and determine whether or not what you're hearing is confessing Jesus, whether what you're hearing agrees with what the scriptures are saying to you about Jesus. If it isn't, if it's not confessing Jesus, or if it's not in agreement with the scriptures, then it's false teaching, John says, the spirit of the Antichrist, and we should not believe it. Now, that sets up a pretty daunting task for us, doesn't it? If we really are surrounded by false teachers like this, then it's pretty clear that the odds are stacked against us. It would seem as if winning 16 hockey games in over four rounds of playoffs and winning the Stanley Cup is a lot easier than doing what we got to do, navigating our way through this world where false teaching is literally at every turn. But the whole point of this, remember, is that John wants us to see the hope that we have in the midst of all of this, the very, very good reason we have Be hopeful. He who is in you, John says, is greater than he who is in the world. We may be surrounded by false teachers, and those false teachers, those false prophets may be inhabited by this spirit of the Antichrist. But we're also surrounded, you and I, on all sides by Jesus himself, and Jesus himself actually lives and dwells within us. Risen from the dead, Jesus promises that we who have been baptized into his death and resurrection are like branches that are attached to the vine. We are the branches, Jesus says, and he is the vine. We are attached to him, and he is attached to us. We are in him, and he is in us. At this conference that I attended in Niagara Falls earlier this week, one of the speakers that we had, he brought up this this allusion that Jesus makes to vines and branches, and he pointed us out to the vineyards that are all around there in Niagara Falls, and he said to us, if you go out and look at one of those, those plants, those vines that's growing out there, you can't sit there and look at it and say, well, that's a vine and that's a branch. You can't really look at a plant and, and make that distinction. Unless, of course, the branch has been separated from the vine and it's sitting on the ground. Then you know it's a branch. Otherwise, branches and vines are so closely connected together that you can't really tell where one ends and the other begins. And that's how it is with us and Jesus. He is the vine and we are the branches. Through baptism, he has connected us to himself, and he is in us, and we are in him. He who is in you, John says, is greater than he who is in the world. John's reminding us here that this struggle that's going on in the world between light and darkness is not some struggle between equals whether it's false prophets, the spirit of the Antichrist, or even the devil himself. Jesus is greater than all of them, and none of them will be able to separate you from his love. As you engage with the world around you, as you think critically about what it is that you're seeing and hearing, as you compare what it is you're seeing and hearing to what has been delivered and handed over to you in the scriptures to look and see if it confesses Jesus as the Christ, Jesus himself is working in you and through you to guide you, to protect you, to keep you connected to himself, and to deliver you, just like we ask him to in the Lord's Prayer, from all evil. He is greater, far greater than anyone or anything in the world. Through him, in fact, the whole world was made. And by his death and resurrection, he has already overcome the world and has given his victory 
to you. So yes, you have every reason, even in the midst of a world like this one, to be hopeful. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And the hope you have as a result of all of this, it's not a hope to win some trophy or something like that, but the hope of eternal life. The hope of a new heaven and a new earth with Jesus, the greater one in you and with you in him, living and dwelling in you. This is the assurance, this is the hope that you have. He will raise your body from the dead on the last day and give you everlasting life. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that the false prophets, the false teachers, the spirit of the Antichrist or anyone else can do about it. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.